We are about one minute until the top of the hour. I'll turn it over to my co-host, um, Jackie Godot and Haley to help get those additional people admitted from the lobby. Again, this is our session eight for the TRAM 2023 conference series. We do appreciate everyone who is joining us. Without further ado, I'll introduce our presenters for today and then we will try to get started at the top of the hour then with our presentation. So we have today with us Derek, who is the lead trauma registry professional for Palomar Medical Center in Escondido, and also he works with a center in Joplin, Missouri. He has a bachelor's degree in health and human services. He holds a current CSTR certification, and he is a speaker for SDHIA. Past presentations include a poster for TCAA. He is involved in his community with volunteer efforts that include his serving as chair and co-chair for the San Diego Trauma Registry Committee, he is also a member of the ATS CSTR Leadership Advisory Group and leads the Mentorship Study Guide Workbook and Resource Initiative. Garlanda is an experienced trauma registry professional with 10 years of experience. She obtained her CSTR in 2014 and her CAISS in 2021. She is currently employed with Palomar Health. She works remotely since January of 2022, so she understands those struggles as well from being on site to versus being remote. Previous employment in that trauma registry professional role also includes Henry Ford Wyandotte since 2013. So with that, I will get us started and turn it over to our first presenter, Garlanda. Thank you, Amanda. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. So our presentation, my portion here, a new trend transforming hospital events into PI. So let's go to our first slide, please. Thank you. All right. So first you want to understand that hospital events in themselves do not equate to failure. Um, we need to know that not every patient is going to experience a hospital event, which is fine. Um, you know, we want to have that, but at the same time, we want to recognize that if we're not capturing any hospital events at all in our patient population, it may actually mean that our center is not identifying the ones that are actually occurring. And so that being said, we also need to realize that not all hospital events are preventable despite our best efforts, but they do provide great opportunities to identify where we can improve patient care. And we are uh, able to correct any weaknesses in current processes. Thank you. So communication is crucial. Um, the trauma registrars, we are able to define the patient conditions that are specific to the NTDS standards. Right now, there are 21 identifiable and reportable events and they all have specific criteria. And so as the data dictionary is updated or changes are made, the trauma registrar is definitely your resource to understand those specific conditions and the definitions for them. And then accurate reporting of any hospital events that occur provides another way to be able to benchmark against other uh, similar performing trauma centers. So what are some of the things that you will look out for? Well, you always want to pay attention, for example, patients who've been on a ventilator for more than a couple of days. That should be something to be looking out for. Um, are they experiencing any type of VAP, ventilator-associated pneumonia? Are there infiltrates that are seen on imaging? Does the patient have a fever? Um, has infectious disease been consulted? So we have these patients on the ventilator, be looking out for that uh, pneumonia. What about those patients that have indwelling urinary catheters? We want to be aware and look out for any type of caudies or catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Again, is the patient experiencing any fevers? Are there any organi organisms identified in urine cultures? Now, again, just because a patient has a fever, that in itself does not mean that patient has pneumonia or a U or UTI. However, that is one of the symptoms, and so we want to look out for those things. 
And then to pay attention with, to our patients that have pre-existing conditions already that could put them at risk. One example here is if a patient has a history of alcohol use disorder, they are then at risk for alcohol withdrawal syndrome. So we don't wanna miss that um, if it, ha it happens. And so then to any change in patient status should be looked at. There are things that patients may experience that may not fall into those 21 identifiable things um, for, according to the NTDS. We don't want to ignore those because we also want to capture that. But any change in patient status, we want to be paying attention to because it could fall into um, that category that we're looking for. Next slide. So identify and verify. Documentation is key so that we all know what's going on with the patient from physician documentation, nursing documentation, all of these things are important. Any little thing, we talked about the fevers, but it may be other things as well. So documentation is key to know what's going on. And then we may have some events that seem very straightforward. I have an example here, a patient that's admitted may be doing well. Suddenly they develop slurred speech, drooping eyes, of course, you get your neurosurgeon involved, you run the CAT scan and so forth. We see that embolism. So there we have a patient that's that has experienced a CVA while they're in house. That's pretty straightforward. You know, everything was right in line, falling into place. Other things though, other hospital events may not be so straightforward. So we have a, a hospital event such as delay or I'm sorry, unplanned OR visit. Was it really unplanned? Again, that's where that documentation is very important. Was the initial plan for the injury to treat non-operatively? If not, were there mitigating factors that postponed the surgery, such as swelling, patient health, and so forth, that caused the surgery to be delayed? So in other words, was there a plan for surgery or not? So this is where we kind of get into the weeds of things with certain hospital events and unplanned OR or operating room is one of those. But again, falling back on that documentation, we wouldn't miss this hospital event. At the same time, we wouldn't unnecessarily add a hospital event to our patient case if, we, if it's not needed. So it is imperative, I touched on it earlier, that trauma registrars are in communication. It's important that we attend these meetings where patients are being discussed. Because again, we specifically are looking for specific things. And so it's important to be able to communicate that with the staff so that way they know what we're looking for and we can all work together. We're able to also communicate the documentation that we need. So we can uh, help to educate the staff. You know, if, if you see this, if you document this a certain way and or uh, have these things in your notes, we're better able to tease apart what is actually going on with those patients. And then we can bring some of those questions to the table. So that way, if something is being documented a different type of way and causing something to be missed, that can also be addressed. And then participation and cooperation among multiple dis disciplines helps to ensure accuracy as well. Again, looking at those infectious disease reports, lab reports for uh, different changes. Um, and then nurse clinical observations and documentation. You know, what are the nurses seeing on the floor and documenting that then can be looked at by the physician, looked at by the trauma registrar to make sure that we are capturing any hospital events that apply to our patient population. So you know what to do, now what? You have a hospital event. So let's look at any contributing factors. For one, were any protocols or processes not followed? We also talked about patients' underlying health conditions playing a role. Say for example, a patient already has COPD. Maybe they have asthma, maybe they have other things going on with them that were contributing factors to their overall health or contributed to something happening in the hospital. Once we see that, then we can identify opportunities for improvement. Are screening tools being used? For example, we have a um, hospital event of delirium. Well, are screening tools being used? One example is that CAM assessment. Is that being used to identify those patients who are experiencing delirium not due to alcohol withdrawal, though. Again, <laughs> documentation 
and you know, knowing your patient uh, history and so forth, all of these things are important to make sure that we are capturing the correct hospital event and not adding events to ourselves that don't apply. And then education and re-educating staff is important. Okay, next one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> and then we want to learn from any um, hospital event that we uh, did identify. Um, we want to choose one and delve deep to see what could have been done differently. And then when we do that, again, we want to communicate that with staff. You know, let them know of any findings because maybe things were being seen and, again, were, they were not aware that certain things uh, should have been escalated or whatever the case may be. As trauma registrars, we know exactly what those hospital events are that we're looking for. And so we can help staff to be aware of identifying signs and symptoms early um, in patient care so these things can be identified. Um, and then, once again, any change in patient status is not so much to get caught up in, well, maybe this is an NTDB event, and maybe it's not any change in patient status will want to be communicated to identify these issues early. And if it's an event that we need to capture, then we'll be able to do that. Because the goal is to help patients recover from any event and prevent as many as possible from reoccurring. Thank you. That was really informative. I appreciate your, your yeah, yeah. You got some more. Got to, nope, got that's more. the last one I had. Oh, Yep, that's the last okay, one I had okay. from yours. So these presenters were going to kind of, so Garlanda was so gracious. So she kind of went over that overview. And these are your hospital events. And I actually learned a few things. I think I'm going to take that tip about choosing an event and really digging deep into it. I think at some of my centers, I will actually take that and kind of dig deep and see what's going on at the center level and how we're capturing that. So Derek will actually present now on what happens when we identify some of these things? What do we do once we've identified that we have an issue? So I'll turn it over to Derek. Well, thank you, Amanda, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you, Garlanda, for that uh, very insightful presentation. Um, I do agree that establishing compliance standards is important to prevent or mitigate hospital events and promote uh, quality care. Okay, can you see my uh, slides okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, so today we'll take a look at uh, methods and trends to establish PI projects for your trauma center. So let's look at some steps to improve your outcomes. You want to determine what needs to be improved. Uh, measure your data quality for accuracy, reliability, relevance, and timing. Analyze your data. Uh, this helps highlight improvement opportunities, spotlights your trends and patterns in your data and your behaviors. Uh, implement change. Uh, an example of implementing change is to introduce a new or revised guideline to promote timely administration of antibiotics for open fractures. Uh, then you want to reevaluate the effectiveness of the change that was implemented. Know your data. So perform data validations. Uh, understand how your data interacts in your system. Um, identify trends, study your data. Use metrics, goals, and initiatives to drive decisions. Identify the impact of potentially preventable hospital events and categorize those events. Uh, for example, a, a major event is an unexpected event that caused significant temporary harm, long-term permanent harm, or unintended harm leading up to and including death. So for an example, uh, an instrument that was left inside of a patient after surgery, which required the patient to return to OR for removal of that object could be a, a major event that occurred. Uh, a repeat event is an event that causes minimal damage or harm. Uh, for instance, a recurring of infection. Uh, a complex event is an event that identifies challenges to providing care. Uh, for example, uh, remote patient monitoring. Uh, with remote patient monitoring, um, that can create challenge if the monitoring solution fails. So like in this scenario, it will require a more comprehensive analysis amongst the players and stakeholders to identify a solution for continued best practices. Here is a sample of knowing how to display your data using a scattergram. 
to identify trauma surgeon response times for full trauma team activations. Uh, it's safe to say here that there are little opportunities. However, working toward 100% of these timely responses could be a goal. Um, you can also run a report to determine uh, when traits are placed in your patients with severe TBI. Uh, you know the goal is to place traits in the patient population within three to seven days, uh, if not sooner. So the timeliness of a procedure is key when evaluating your CPG compliance. Drill down on your outliers and your fallouts. Uh, verify the accuracy of the data and measure your data quality. Uh, when, when measuring your data quality, be meticulous. Um, set a high standard when analyzing the data, especially when time is included in the data set. Uh, what do we want to consider when analyzing start time to MTP initiation? Uh, what can be learned? What can be improved? How can we improve? Uh, what teams can also help improve in your MTP start times? Uh, so let's drill down even a little further into our MTP data. Here we're looking at evaluating an RBC to FFP ratio for MTPs. So you identify that there's an MTP with a zero RR PRBC to FFP ratio. Is this a documentation issue? Are there other factors that may have contributed to a zeroed out ratio? I want to analyze your data to really dig down and see if there's some answers out there for you and seek those answers and you shall find some solutions to the opportunities that you have identified. Here we're analyzing a number of of cranies and the timings of when the procedures occurred. Again, ensure your data is able to demonstrate a timeline of events that occurred during the patient's phase of care and determine where those opportunities lie. Uh, in this scenario, this family elected for no intervention. And as you can see, there's a high outlier of 38 hours to an ICP placement. And although the family elected for no in for intervention, and more family decided came to the hospital and then there was a change of heart, which sometimes we do see. So although this may be an outlay, uh, outlier, there may be other opportunities for time their placement of ICPs. Um, you know, is this a one off? Um, do you currently have a benchmark time for when ICP should be placed? How are you track tracking your CPGs to determine that they are being adhered to? And then what does your re-evaluation process consist of? In this sample, we're looking at reevaluating what we changed with the moving average. So is this success or is this progress? Can the bar continue to be raised? If so, how? And now for many of us, what happens when the well runneth dry? We, we've all been to this scenario. You know, we've we've looked at our data, we've implemented new CPGs, we've jumped through all the hoops we can with what we have, and sometimes we don't even have someone to help man the well. So, so what do we do in this situation? You know, we, we've gotten all the juice we can, you know, squeeze all the juice that we can from the squeeze, right? So what do we do now? So let's look at how there are new MOI trends that are starting to be evaluated uh, based upon changes in technology or changes in uh, recreational equipment. So have you considered looking at how e-bikes injuries are increasing all over the country? Are they also um, popping up in your neighborhoods? How are they impacting your centers? How about your neighboring facilities? How can you help to slow the increase? Um, you can cast a wider net and work with your local trauma centers to address injury prevention in your communities. You can collaborate with your pre-hospital personnel, your community leaders, uh, school representatives, and also your county officials to help promote safety awareness. Uh, another initiative that is out is how, how are we reporting on our cage and spurt audits um, to help meet the requirements in the grade book? Have you implemented a service line uh, reporting approach for your cage and spurt audits? Um, are you tracking these trends through your dashboards? How often are you reporting them out? So here's something that we identified and what we've done to look at what our cage numbers are telling us. So we do have a weekly multi-D rounds to address these care needs, difficult discharges, and opportunities related to cage and spurt. 
Um, this also allows the providers to come together uh, to have a more complete view of patients' needs across the continuum of care. So now that we have identified that there was some trends that were, if you will, less favorable, uh, we decided to develop an action plan, right? So you want to take the research of data, start your process by defining the topic that you want to research. Then you want to narrow your topic, gather your background information, and then create a research question. Develop your working thesis as you find and evaluate resources or sources to help you promote a change within your workplace. And then you're going to write your paper. You know, these steps will help you describe the complexities of your findings and then identify next steps to increase compliance, reduce risk, and improve overall care. So you wrote your you wrote your paper or your action plan, which is usually in the form of one to two pages, and you've identified a PI project. Uh, you've established and you've in, implemented change. Um, one thing to note is it's instrumental that once a practice or process has changed, and you have met your new goal, the work does not stop there. Um, you must continue to reevaluate your action plan and also your results for continued effectiveness. So for there may be a time when things go south, uh, maybe there was you know, um, change in staffing, uh, maybe there was a change in your order sets for your EMR, Whatever may may occur, sometimes things do change, so we have to be prepared for the change. And then what is your plan of corrective action to write your ships when you do continue to reevaluate your process? Um, and then lastly, you want to interact with your data. Always know if, if the juice is worth the squeeze, right? You want to measure your outcomes, institute meaningful change. Uh, validate your efforts, reevaluate for effectiveness, and always better your best. And that's all. Thank you. So I'm hoping that Garlanda will graciously kind of walk us through because I found what she was talking about. <laughs> so when you when you when you've gone through this process, like Derek said, your your PI process it doesn't stop there. You, it's a continuous cycle of going back and continuing to look deep at those data elements and what's in your registry and that education and re-education. But kind of, will you graciously walk us through kind of what you do then, <laughs> Garlanda, <laughs> to get back to just what Derek said. So it's just a re repeating cycle really of going through, you've got these data elements and you're, you're tracking and trending them. So you've got a trend that becomes a PI project. And then you're right back to, OK, we've identified something else. And then so so what do you do? So thanks. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. Yeah. No problem. No problem at all. <laughs> so this is where, again, this data collection um, is very important. Um, all of these things, you know, where are these instances occurring? Is it on a certain floor of the hospital? Is it a certain shift? Is it a certain team member? Um, all of these things are important. And then are there mistakes? or are there errors in technique? Again, it's not for punitive, but it could be a need for education. So, you know, are there are mistakes being made? Are there errors or things like that? And again, a patient's underlying um, health conditions could always be a factor. So you always want to consider that also. And then looking at that root cause, what is the core issue that set things in motion? So a mistake may have been made or there may have been an error, but because of that error, something wasn't done or something was done incorrectly. And so that, you know, could set things in motion. Um, and so that's, those are the things that we want to identify and look at. And then once we do that, we want that next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, again, educating staff, including physicians, you know, they have a lot on their plate. They have a lot of things that they're doing, but there are also a lot of changes. So we're the ones looking at the um, NTDS standards, the data dictionary. So you want to make sure to pass on that um, education. And then once we are educating the staff, then we want to recommend and implement solutions. Once these are uh, implemented or adopted, if you will, then we need to set a time frame. This is where we want to see what we if what we propose is actually going to start working. So you have your time frame, and when you noticed that things were going south, as Derek mentioned. Now we're going to set a time frame. Now we're going to do this 
aspect. Now let's see what happens going forward. Um, what's working? What isn't working? You know, um, so we need to understand that as well. And so once we see what is working, now we're going to establish stand, establish those standards so that way we can prevent further incidences of the same thing happening. And then we want to go ahead and close that loop. We want to document the issue resolution. And then like as Derek was saying too, once we do that, it's not just the one and done because further down, something could also happen. But we want to be able to identify that. You know, what happened in this particular incident? We had things in place that seemed to be going good, you know, and it could just be a one-time thing. So we still want to continue to, um, you know, monitor that once we have that. And then I just had just a, um, a quick example. I think you might be on the other slide. Yeah, so identifying uh, PEs among your older rib fracture patients. You wanna pull this data from your registry, patient age, pre-existing condition, the MOI, who admitted the patient, did trauma admit them, did medicine admit them? Because that too could determine, what well, does determine often their care, different things that were done, when things were done, you know, it's oftentimes based on the admitting service. So we want to compile all of this information, discuss these patients at the multi multidisciplinary meetings, and then delve into their medical record review to find out everything that happened with these patients experiencing pulmonary embolisms. And again, this is just an example. Next slide, please. So you may find that the incentive spirometry was not being consistently included in their patient, I mean, in their uh, care plan for these patients. So you want to communicate the necessity of getting that done. Some staff may need to be educated on the process. Do they know where to find the equipment? Is there enough equipment to do what they need to do? Um, and then are there stop checks in place before this patient has been discharged? Is there a documentation showing that they have been educated on incentive spirometry? Do they know how to do it? And whatever was uh, being done, however much they pulled, um, you know, their values, are those documented? So that way we know what's going on. So then you want to maybe review those rib fracture patients for about six months and see if there are any incidences of PEs, pulmonary embolisms, during that time frame that you're tracking these um, rib fracture patients. Again, making sure that these fractures that you're looking at are not CPR patients. You know, you want to make sure we're grabbing the right population um, and tracking accordingly. You know, again, detail is important, documentation is important. <laughs> so then looking to see, you know, in, um, implementing that incentive spirometry, um, what is it doing? Um, and decreasing the incidence of pulmonary embolism in patients with rib fractures. Um, and so again, learning from any identified um, hospital event is important. I used this example um, previously mm -hmm. about the CAM assessment tool. And again, the things to take away, any change in patient status needs to be communicated because the goal is to help patients recover. So communication, identification, documentation, all of those things are important. <laughs> I appreciate you, that. Yes, I appreciate you going through that for us and kind of I think that is the part that has always confused me the most is like how do you for sure know when you're at loop closure? Like how do you know when it's a true resolution because it's like you said it's always that continued cycle of looking to see if there's another change and I'm like well, we didn't close the loop if it's happening again but you can close the loop. I liked the point that you made that you are able to close the loop and you have another incident that occurs later. That's, yes, it's the same type of incident, but that's not because the loop wasn't closed on that previous case or subset of cases that you were reviewing. So I know that all attendees are in listen only mode, but we do appreciate if you want to put in questions or into the chat or the Q&A if you have questions for the presenters. And I apologize, I had pulled the wrong <laughs> PowerPoint up. That's okay. <laughs> Technology out. has not been my friend this week. <laughs> I don't see any questions per se. 
I can't believe there's not more questions. So if a trauma case gets referred to CQC or MEC or further medical review, would you expect feedback from that meeting for loop closure? Great question. Yes, absolutely. That is a great question. Um, anytime that you are looking for either a tertiary or a quaternary review, um, yes, in order to have a true loop closure, you should receive some sort of feedback from the liaison who uh, you have either re um, sent that, um, feed that review expectation to, and then you want to be able to document when you received uh, the feedback so then you can appropriately close the loop. Uh, sometimes um, within that review, you may see that there is a change in practice. So it may not be a provider level. It may um, be a system level change that is going to be presented to the entire group organization from that liaison. And you'll want to just make note of that change as well and, and who was also educated. So that can help provide your, the ACS reviewers or whoever your state reviewers are a little bit more detail as far as what action really did occur when you did receive that uh, feedback so you can truly close the loop at that time. Great question. Any other questions? I'm hoping that they're just typing it in. <laughs> I think I have a question on maybe when you're looking at, we'll just say those planned and unplanned ORs. So Garlanda, I know that you talked about delving into some of those. Do you run that um, report or do you create a report maybe and review those data elements or those specific hospital events for quality to make sure that they're being abstracted? Do you do all cases? Do you do a percentage? to kind of look and see if you're having an issue with even the abstraction versus the actual processes of care? So um, it's not necessarily all cases, but what we have been doing internally is looking at when patients are going to surgery. So we are pulling those, you know, if they're above that uh, 24 to 48 hours, um, that's an automatic, you know, flag for us to look at and see is it delayed or um, you know, what was the reason that the patient didn't get surgery within a specific time frame? Um, and then, of course, looking at that documentation, because sometimes we'll see where it's a certain amount of swelling or something happened. The plan is for surgery, but they're waiting for something specific. And so in that case, you know, we're not going to assign that unplanned OR because, you know, they had to wait for something else. But if the plan was not to go to OR, you know, then that's that's where the discussion is with, you know, the physician or whatever. What was the reasoning or the plan of the change in plan of care? So, yeah, Makes at that. But having the time frame of when the patients go to the OR, run a report like that, then that can uh, help us to streamline which patients that we're going to be looking at for that specific event. Derek, did you want to add something to that? Um, I, I think that was summed up very well. Uh, I think the only thing I would add is uh, sometimes uh, centers may have providers that say, hey, I have clinic. And so, hey, I'll get to the patient tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you have to factor some of those um, elements into the PI process as you're evaluating specific events and then look at how you can, if you will, um, kind of instill some accountability um, in order to make sure that, that we are not only meeting our mark, but if you will, we're, we're meeting the bar. So we're kind of, you know, raising the bar at that point. That makes perfect sense. I know for me, um, I do have a quasi-clinical background being an EMT for a while and a combat medic. But I think one of the things that our non-clinical registry professionals um, struggle with is really understanding what to look for. And I know you mentioned, Garlanda, in part of your presentation that that's one of the key things that centers should develop and communicate in their education of the trauma team, whether it be the registry professionals or PI or our providers, is, you know, what, what do we need to see in the record 
in order to capture that. Um, did you do that at your center? Like, do you have like little note cards that are like, hey, provider, put this in for this. If you want me to capture this, make sure this is here because I'm considering doing that at one of my centers. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, you know, thankfully at my, when I was working at the, my other center, um, I was privileged to be able to sit in on the trauma meetings, peer review, um, operations and so forth. So that gave me an opportunity to sit right in with the physicians or the liaisons, whether it's, you know, uh, radiology, all of them, anesthesia to help them to understand what I needed. There were instances where I would even show examples from the AIS book for coding um, to describe certain things. You know, I would have an example. This is what I see in your notes, but you see how I can't pull this because I don't, <laughs> I don't, I can't pull anything based on what you have. <laughs> So, um, you know, document, being able to sit in in those meetings and to communicate um, and helping them to see concretely, you know, where I'm trying to show what you're doing and we're trying to show the care that we're providing or, you know, the changes that we're making. But I can't do that if you're not documenting a certain way. So, yes, in my previous center, I was able to do that. Um, and it was it was very helpful for everyone, really, because they were able to see like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, Since. to have that documentation. Sure. We have another question coming in. So does hospital quality normally record and track trauma, OPPE and FPPE, or is it routinely recorded and tracked by trauma services? I've learned in my facility there are several people in several different departments doing the same thing. This is going to be based upon your institution. Um, as far as for our practice, uh, primarily the OPPEs are um, really kind of go through the process with our trauma service line independently. We do work in kind of in parallel with our CMO and, if you will, our um, some of our C suite in order to track some. Uh, opportunities um, as far as working with quality we we run in parallel with them as well um, however um, depending on your institution it does um, you know it really does really depend upon how the hierarchy is established and who is who's what's the reporting structure uh, because that's really what's going to determine you know who's responsible for accountability for the providers and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I think it's we're all unique um, in how we approach um, establishing and tracking our OPPEs and FPPEs. Um, but I think as long as you're tracking them, I think that's the best part. Um, I think when you need to work with your C-suite or maybe like your chief medical officer in order to identify like a trend, uh, maybe of removing someone from a from the call. Um, that's when it gets above my pay grade. So, so I imagine that those <laughs> discussions are had. Um, but like I said, that's a way above my pay grade. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Any other questions? Can't believe where's Haley? Haley's always got questions. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't see. I was just going to ask if maybe you could explain some of these acronyms you're throwing around for the people who don't do PI on a regular basis. I think it would be helpful. That's a great point. Um, so some of the acronyms I know that we've talked about are um, just from the questions in the chat, the CQC and MEC. So that's usually like your, go ahead, yeah, Derek. Like I'd say it's probably like your, your chief quality committee. It could be named differently at different centers. Yeah. Your MEC could be your uh, like med exec committee. Um, yeah. So it may be, it just could be how it's defined. Like we have trauma committee. Some of them might have or uh, like M&M or might be like morbidity and mortality committee. Um, 
So if there's any specific acronyms that you um, have questions about yet, please um, feel free to ask. Um, yeah, I've heard it called Clinical Quality Committee, too. And yeah, um, the OPP and FPPE are two other acronyms, and I'm looking through the presentations to see if I find others. Yeah, so the, so the OPPE is considered your ongoing professional practice evaluation, and that's going to be for the providers. I don't, I see CAGE is another. That is a screening tool. Um, and I'm trying to look, I'm trying to remember what it's even called myself. I'm like, well, no, what does that acronym stand for? CAGE, because I just always call it CAGE. <laughs> Do y'all know it off your head, Derek? Cut, I, I think annoyed, it's cut, guilty, yeah. cut, annoyed, guilty, I. and I. So it's a, yeah, a substance abuse screening tool. Yeah. I'm just like, you know, the cage abuse. And <laughs> that's, that's how I just, I'm like, <laughs> and that's how I, but I knew that cage was not the abuse, <laughs> cage abuse. <laughs> Any others? Thanks, Lori Hickman, for that um, question on cage. Got me on my toes. You had me over here Googling. I was like, what does that stand for? It's not what I think it is. Um, your CAM screen, I think that was included, and you'll have that within your um, PowerPoint that we send out. That's that confusion assessment method. So that was another screening tool that they talked about. Um, looking to see if there's a PEs, pulmonary embolism, I think we, we called PE. Um, I don't remember which. Caldy catheter associated urinary tract infection, VALP ventilator assist associated pneumonia. That that's another um, couple of acronyms from like how do you know when you have a problem and how do you identify that there is a trend kind of that that portion of the presentation. I don't remember all of Derek's charts if there were acronyms there. Um, NTDS, National Trauma Data Standard. Ooh, I don't think we talked about any others. Any others? Um, ever, anyone with questions? Uh, potentially a TS, that was trauma surgeon. Yeah. Um, MTP would be your mass transfusion protocol. Um, ICP would be your intracranial pressure monitor. CBG, uh, I feel that was mentioned. I didn't know what it was. Maybe I heard wrong. Oh, uh, CPG, uh, clinical practice guidelines. Some of them called yeah. CPMGs. Clinical Practice Management Guidelines. Yep. So those are your clinical pathways for care, if you will. Yep. Others are call them like BPGs, Best Practice Guidelines. I've seen centers. It's so weird like how these acronyms get kind of tossed around from one center to another and they get kind of lost in translation. I'm going through that now. I'm working with two different centers and one uses certain acronyms one way and another is something else. And I'm like, okay, so this means this and this means that. I'm like, I almost have to make a translation thing. I'm like, good thing I'm a registrar and I know how to map data elements and menu values. <laughs> that was a great point, Haley. Thank you so much. I See, I knew she would come through right in the clutch when we needed her. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Um, I know <laughs> Derek had some phenomenal graphics that he presented to show how to track and trend those. And while not all registry professionals 
may create those data visualizations. We're probably more on the end of where Garlanda's at. We're reading through all this written documentation and we're like, that's a problem. And in my mind, I know I've seen 20 of those this month at least, <laughs> at least. Um, but really being able to, to know how to transition that into that data visualization piece um, is kind of like an evolved skill from registry up into and including PI. Not that a registry professional can't do it. Obviously, they can. You see Derek does, and many others are beginning to hone those skills of how to kind of take that data and manage it and then turn it into information that you can use from those visualizations to report out to, like Derek said, the C-suite. The slides will be from both presentations. We will get those um, into a PDF format, and I promise I will give the full slide deck from Garlanda. I won't even chop it in half. I'll give it to you all at once. <laughs> and, you know, Amanda, I was going to say, too, um, you know, to your point, even though I was at a level three trauma center before, um, you know, having the support of your you know, trauma program manager and so forth, being at, at those meetings, um, I was able to um, run those reports for those ones, especially at operations. You know, was a I was a standing agenda item um, at our operations meeting, which again, it, some may call it other names. But, um, you know, being able to, because that's when I was able to present to everyone, because it was multidisciplinary, I guess it would be that called in other places. Um, so nursing staff from the floor, from the emergency department, from ICU, um, and all the other physicians, they were able to all see the updates from the NTDB, NTDS. So everybody at the same time was getting all the updates. So, you know, therein, again, lies my point about the trauma registrar being involved. And yes, sometimes having to develop that skill of report writing and stuff, and then making it visual and very interesting for all these people in the room at different um, levels. Um, so thankfully, Derek is so gracious to continue doing all the report writing and stuff at this point. So I can, you know, stay in the trenches, which I don't mind. I don't mind being down in the trenches, which is good. But to your point, that is a skill set definitely for registrars to obtain um, that report writing. And I have plenty of experience with that at my other facility. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely. I don't see any others coming in. So just a reminder, this was recorded and we will get it into a finalized format and I will get it out onto the TRAM YouTube channel within the next couple of days. I know there's a gray book meeting or something or another I'm probably late to. Um, <laughs> but um, so, so I don't know that I'll get it done tonight, but I'm going to try my best to get it done tonight. So if you know others who were at the ACS gray book review, um, then let them know they can go out to the tram site. I will also send out the follow-up email that includes that PDF handout and the link to get your certificate of attendance. This is the final um, session that we have planned for the trams conference series. Um, I've had a couple of presenters ask me if they could do something in December, but it's not been finalized. If for some reason we do, I will send out a huge email to everyone who has attended any of the conferences with a link for that. Um, with things so close to the holidays, I don't foresee it happening, but there's a slight, little slight, little tiny possibility. So I appreciate, thank you all for joining. Thank you so very much to our presenters today and being so gracious to kind of be flexible with my mishap with technology, I apologize. And for all of this great kind of back and forth, these are the webinars I really like the most or the ones where you can kind of talk back and forth and you can kind of get some questions answered and have some open discussion. I think people respond more to that than a lecture type webinar. So with that, I'll let you go for the day. I appreciate you um, and we will talk soon, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.